touch, hearing, smell, taste, sight. We perceive the external world through our five senses. But there is a sixth, more enigmatic, more difficult to define in a few words. It is with us from birth and determines all our movements. The sixth sense is proprioception. Our ability to stand upright is this. The permanent perception of the position of our body, balanced or unbalanced. The ability to situate each of our limbs in space and to do it subconsciously is this. The possibility to project our actions mentally is partly this. Thanks to several technical advances, scientists are now able to study it precisely. In laboratories, a number of ongoing experiments may well reveal to us the true nature of proprioception. By learning to know it better, we are going to find out just how essential it is, constantly interacting with all our other senses. Choreographer Johan Bourgeois likes to test the sixth sense. While the other five senses are familiar to us, this one is more mysterious. We call upon it with each movement, often subconsciously. In fact, what we're doing on this stage is neither more nor less than what we do every second, all the time, in our daily life. Except that in daily life we forget about it. I've forgotten that while I'm talking to you, my body is constantly finding its balance. Our sixth sense, permanently at work, adapts our movements to the constraints we are under. I really like the expression, try to stand up, which has in fact been the instruction that I've given to the dancers throughout the production. Try to stand up. I like this expression because it's very concrete, very physical, and at the same time has almost existential implications. Without proprioception, we couldn't do much. We couldn't walk without looking at the ground, nor jump, nor run. It grants us that freedom of movement, without which everything would become very complicated. In an extremely rare phenomenon, there are today in the world five people who have been completely deprived of their sixth sense. At the age of 30, Jeanette lost her proprioceptive sensitivity after suffering from an autoimmune illness. She is able to walk. Her muscles and spinal cord are intact. However, without proprioception, standing up is a challenge and is risky. I'm quite able to get up, but I have to see each of my limbs. I can't organize each movement. There's a system of commands and concentration that I can't use. I've really tried, but I can't do it because I can't find myself in space if I can't see. 
When I lost my proprioception, I had no idea that it even existed. Proprioception, where did it come from? I had no idea. Jeanette has learned, little by little, to describe her disability. It's a rare diagnosis, which has interested doctors for a long time. It has become a major field of study for advancing research, especially at the Marseille Institute of Movement Sciences. Jeanette has been followed by Fabrice Salinia for 10 years. The sense of proprioception is less well known, especially because cases of pathologies affecting proprioception are less well known. I'll give you an example. We've all heard about people who have poor vision or cannot see, and we can put ourselves in their place simply by putting on a blindfold or closing our eyes. So we can understand how these people behave and what they don't have. Now, proprioception, these are internal sensations which are difficult to manipulate and to understand. That's why, in order to understand proprioception better, we choose to work with people who have been affected by pathologies and have lost it. Wishing to help in this research, Jeanette is taking a series of tests, from the very simple to the most complicated. As long as I don't speak, hold that pose. So, what we'll notice is that simple movements, for example, trying to hold my hand in a position, when these people close their eyes, they can no longer, as I can, hold a position. And we can see that with the arm moving one way and another, these people don't realize that's happening, which in the end shows us that we are able to accomplish simple tasks such as hold a position thanks to proprioceptive information. Without this information, Jeanette can't make gestures which seem at first to be obvious. If her right arm is hidden and placed in a certain position, she cannot put her left arm in the same position. The entire representation of the body is disturbed. To compensate for this disability, she has adapted by exerting another sense which allows her, in spite of this, to make quite precise movements, sight. I'm going to turn out the light, you'll be in the dark. Great. Like that, you won't be able to see your limbs. You won't see anything in the room. Once in the dark, her movements become more confused. Without visibility, she moves systematically past the lit target she should touch. In the dark, she can't tell where her hand is in space. She can try a movement. She can think or estimate that she is sending her hand to a place. But if there is a mistake in that estimation and in the command to send, she will be unable to estimate it. And so what we're seeing here is that she makes quite big mistakes, a lot bigger than we would see in a person of the same age who didn't have a proprioceptive disability. Jeanette's world, without proprioception, has become a visual world. She has even lost the sense of touch. With her eyes open, she can write her name with no difficulty. Okay. okay, eyes shut. But with her eyes closed, she's lost. G, I, Lee. The table, her hand on the sheet of paper, everything becomes random. Z, O, T. We call on our sixth sense to make the smallest gesture. Without being conscious of the complexity used to get it to happen. By informing us constantly of our position in space, proprioception sets us free. It means we can do other things have a conversation, listen to music. Jeanette doesn't have that availability. Her attention is, permanently, fixed on what she is trying to do. Her visual concentration is foremost. Even finding the way to her mouth poses problems. I'll stay in Marseille. 
It's nice in the sun. Without proprioception, it is also impossible to estimate the strength and intensity of our movements. When it happened to me, my son was 16 months old. He was just a baby. And I had to pick him up. And then I realized. When I held him, he said, Ow, Mom, you're hurting me. I didn't know my own strength. It must have taken me a month before I really understood my own strength a little better. And then I said to my son, if I pick you up again and I hurt you, you tell me straight away because it's not what I want to do. I really worked hard at that so I could pick up my son without hurting him. I would say that it's a sense, uh, a sense that is a lot more important than the other five. That's the thing I was telling you. Oh, I wasn't sure. Yes, you're behind. Working upon the grace of a gesture, the complexity of a stance, the management of balance. This is what Johann Bourgeois asks from his dancers, so as to make an internal voyage and sharpen their sixth sense. Francesca, you went outside? Yes. OK, well, it can't be seen. It's OK. So you three, the guys, were at the centre straight away without a centrifugal force. I think at the centre of all my work, I am directly calling on the proprioceptive sense, in the sense that all my work destabilises ordinary references. I have the impression that I'm always calling upon that sense. Thanks to this sensorial guide, we can feel the movements of our body. How does proprioception work? Where are our movement sensors located? Measuring the activity of our sixth sense remains a scientific challenge. There's still a lot to discover. You know, when you approach the nerve, you can't feel anything at all. Edith ribo siskar is one of the rare researchers in the world studying proprioception using anatomical criteria. How can we sense our body? We sense our body because it has sensory receptors everywhere. They're in the muscles, joints and tendons, which are activated and excited by movement. Schematically, here is what could be an anatomical representation of proprioception, thousands of receptors. The most important are spread through the muscles of our body. When the receptors are excited, a message is created which is sent through the nerves all the way to the brain. While our muscles allow us to perform an action, at the same time they inform us of the position of the limb which is performing the action. Nerve fibers, these long white strands, are proprioceptive receptors. When the muscle extends, they send signals to the brain. Intercepting these messages is the objective of Edith's research. Thanks to a microelectrode, Edith is trying to record the electrical impulses which are generated by a proprioceptive receptor. As long as the nerve isn't touched, just background noise is audible. 
At first, there are a whole mass of fibers which we record. And then progressively, a little like using a microphone, in that crowd, we go to one person to hear their voice alone. It's the same here. With our electrode, we have the nerve which is made up of all the fibers, and we move with our electrode to one fiber to record its unitary action. Once the electrode is placed perfectly upon one fibre, it is finally possible to hear the activity of a proprioceptive receptor. To record the messages circulating in our nervous system, our muscles must be active. The experiment here consists of letting a robot activate the leg muscles. This robot generates a series of movements which form letters. When the robot draws a letter as it's doing now, and when the muscle housing the receptor which is being recorded is extended, an activity is generated. So there are nerve impulses which code the movement and which are silent when the muscle is relaxed. So the coding corresponds to the degree of extension of the muscle. Each of the letters formed by the foot emits a distinct signal. But how is proprioception a sixth sense? To reply to this question, the scientists are testing it using an illusion. Can proprioception be fooled using illusions of movement, as we can fool our vision through optical illusions? We recorded the nerve messages coming from the muscle receptors while they're making movements which form letters. So now we can take these messages and pilot vibrators which induce mechanical vibrations. So when we apply these vibrations, nerve messages with a muscular origin are generated, and at that moment, the subject can tell us what they perceive, if they perceive a movement. Okay. Okay, for this you'll have to close your eyes. Okay. Stay relaxed. We're starting the vibration. The frequency of the mechanical vibration stimulates the proprioceptive receptors, which start to vibrate at the rhythm of the previously recorded signal. According to the vibrations that he senses, Leonard is sure that his foot is moving and making a letter, while it is in fact completely still. So did you feel a movement? Uh, I thought my foot was drawing an M. An M? Well, that's what we expected. For our brain, these illusions of movement are real. In the way it transmits information, in the same way as sight, hearing, touch, smell or taste, our proprioception really is a sixth sense. These proprioceptive senses constantly inform us, creating a motor sensory loop between our brain and the representation of our body in space. This motor sensory loop is indispensable for maintaining our posture. As proof, if vibrators are placed on the ankles to disturb proprioception, if our eyes were closed, keeping our balance would be impossible. However, Proprioception allows us to accomplish astonishing things when it is combined with the other senses, such as sight and our inner ear. This inner ear is sensitive to acceleration and to the rotation of our head. Thanks to this synchronized information, our brain can always determine the position of our body in space. 
At the Institute of Medicine and Spatial Physiology of Toulouse, it's being asked how the brain can manage to coordinate sight, proprioception, and the inner ear to control the slightest movement. Research engineer at the University Paris Descartes, Michele Tagliabu has come up with a novel procedure. He is using a course of bed rest, where volunteers stay lying down at an angle during two months. They can't sit up, whether it be to move, eat, or perform any other activity. This experiment serves to prepare space missions by simulating on Earth the effects of weightlessness upon the body. Normally, studies involving bed rest are courses which are developed and conceived to study rather its effects upon the cardiovascular, metabolic and respiratory systems. Here, for the first time, we're making a neuroscientific study where we're trying to study the effects that long-term bed rest has on the way in which the brain uses, for example, different sensory information to orient itself in space and control movement. Michele is using this long-term bed rest to see if our verticality, the act of standing, plays the role of a plumb line around which proprioceptive, visual and inner ear information is structured. During two months, he makes the same tests with 20 volunteers. Equipped with a virtual reality helmet, the subjects are emerged in a virtual round cage. Their head movements are recorded and then interpreted by a 3D camera. Michele follows everything live on a control screen. Here, the subject cannot see their hand directly. It is materialized in the virtual cage as an orange cylinder. He has to turn his hand to change the cylinder to green and then memorize that position to reproduce it by using proprioception alone. Then McKelly gives the subject a second test which this time combines vision and proprioception. He asks the volunteer to memorize the angle of a red dotted line and, once it is out of their field of vision, to position their hand at the same angle. It's the second test that is a problem. After two months, the subjects have trouble getting it right. Our results precisely show that what is principally affected by the orientation of the subject in space is the capacity to relate different sensory modalities when the subject is asked to communicate vision by using proprioception, when there is, for example, a visual target and the subject has to reply just by using proprioception because they cannot see the angle of their hand. And this task seems to be strongly affected by the posture of the subject. In fact, in a prolonged lying down posture, the subject is no longer aligned vertically with gravity and then loses the coordination between visual and proprioceptive information. Gravity is therefore a reference point, a plumber's line which structures the perception of our body in space. So Michele and his colleague Joe McIntyre wanted to go where gravity has no effect, into space. They introduced this to the experiments made aboard the International Space Station. Astronaut Thomas Pesky was the first to make the test. The same as performed on Earth, but without gravity. The first results seem to show the same lag between vision and proprioception, 
which had been seen during the bed rest course of experiments. Given that we evolved as a species and as individuals with gravity, it's logical to think that our brain has evolved by using gravity as a privileged reference, a reference around which the brain can align itself and recalibrate different sensory information. Gravity is indeed a plumber's line. Since childhood, we have fought against this force which pulls us towards the center of the Earth. We fight it off by our erect vertical posture. For our brain, this acts as a reference point around which are structured proprioception, vision, and the inner ear. Why gravity has that fundamental importance for us in the coordination of our movements, relating visual and proprioceptive information, is because gravity in reality can be seen all the time since objects always fall in the same direction. At the same time, gravity can always be felt. It acts upon our limbs, and so we can always, even with our eyes closed, know in which direction we are moving, because it always acts in the same direction. So, since gravity is perceived visually and proprioceptively, it's logical to think that it can be used as a liaison point between the two sensory modes. If our proprioception is suddenly disactivated, our vision takes up the work. But what sensation do we have regarding gravity? Since I don't have proprioception, I have the impression that I'm an astronaut because I don't have weight. I can't feel my feet on the ground, nothing. So I always have to look at my feet to be certain that they're on the ground. Without proprioception, Jeanette has the sensation she is floating. She cannot anchor herself to the heart of the world which surrounds her. Trying endlessly to situate yourself links to the problem of meaning, the meaning of our lives, which is a question which can't be answered. This is always a problem. It's linked to existential problems. Exist means to go out of, and beyond the body, to discern the limits of our being with relation to others and to our environment. Proprioception allows us to exist because it creates boundaries between what we are and the space around us. I think that I can't project myself normally into my body because, for example, my chair is part of me. Another example, if I'm in bed, the bed is part of me. I'm part of a person standing beside me, otherwise I'm part of whatever's around me, whether it be a table or a chair, everything is part of me. Jeanette has the feeling that she has been deprived of the boundaries which draw up the limits of our body. This alters for her another function of proprioception, that of the body plan. This is the image we construct of our own body in space. We construct our body plan while growing. If all goes well, when we leave early childhood, we are fully conscious of the whole of our body. This consciousness of ourselves calls largely on proprioceptive information. 
This is the favorite research field of Christine Assayant, neuroscientist at the CNRS of Marseille. Her own children were her first study subjects. We can say that from birth, the ability to act and interact with the environment allows us to create a structure of the body's possibilities, and that will create the body plan. According to what we do or what happens to us, we update our body plan. The more this is enriched, the better we master our movements in space. So how does proprioception participate in the construction of our body plan? A functional MRI can bring answers to that question. This machine records brain activity. And different generations will take part in this. So as not to give false results, there must be no movement. Everyone is equipped with a vibrator which gives the illusion of a movement, that of the ankle being lifted. The MRI allows the visualization of different structures, zones of the brain which are called into action by this illusion of movement. The youngest subjects connect a lot of structures between each other. They use a lot of cerebral structures. However, with older adolescents, we see that the connections are a lot more selective and that for young adults compared with older adolescents, we can also see a progression. So for us, that's the proof that a real maturing process takes place. And this takes time to be integrated during development and adolescence so that the brain can manage to assemble all the information necessary for the body plan. Building our body plan is a long process. A very young child has difficulty finding their mouth at the first try. They don't have a representation of their body. Their brain, lightly structured, has to learn to link visual and proprioceptive information. The adolescent is constantly exploring the limits and capacities of their body their brain begins to efficiently organize visual and proprioceptive information together. They are fully at work building their body plan. For an adult, the perfectly structured brain offers itself a host of organized representations of movement and action. How do we explain this slow progression? By exploring our sixth sense throughout life, which is what Christina Science team is doing. Equipped with motion sensors, an adolescent and then an older person try to keep their balance in a specific position, first with their eyes open and then closed. Stop. That's perfect. Close your eyes now. We've placed them in specific sensory situations. When you're asked to close your eyes during something like that, what remains to control balance is mainly proprioception. Okay, so your eyes are closed? We've seen that Juliette can do it better than her grandfather, but nonetheless, we've seen that Juliette can't do it perfectly. If I'd asked a young adult to do this, they would have managed to put one foot before the other, eyes closed, and controlling their balance without any problem. Juliette has immature proprioception, while her grandfather's sense is less and less reliable. And when we ask him to only use proprioceptive information to control his posture, it's difficult.
Full mastery of our body plan is closely linked to the time we acquire our proprioceptive sense. It is optimal around 23 years old. It's at that age that the adult has an elaborate mental representation of the possibilities of their body. This representation isn't conscious. It happens naturally to create motricity, which happens for a specific goal. An action is made in a particular context and for a very precise objective. Possibly this can involve other social partners. But finally, we're not conscious that in our brain there are many representations of our body in movement which will make an action, but also representations of the characteristics of the action which we will make. Unconsciously, each one of our actions involving proprioception enriches and modifies our body plan and allows us to rapidly face new situations. What research shows us now is that we can also access our proprioception in a conscious fashion. It's a question of concentration. Leonard now has to recognize the letters imposed by the robot by making that effort of concentration. When you concentrate upon a movement, that's to say with your eyes closed, there's no other information which lets us know that there has been a movement. We concentrate upon proprioception and we sensitize our receptors. Messages are sent by the brain to the receptors themselves in such a way as to regulate the flexibility of the receptor and make it more sensitive, depending on the behavioral situation. And especially when we need it, when we concentrate upon the movement, when we need, for example, to recognize that movement, then we will sensitize our receptors through that command which is directly sent to them. M? Yes? Focused on his movements, Leonard stretches his nerve fibers. This tension sends more precise information to the brain. It is then easier for him to recognize the letter sent by the robot. This capacity to concentrate lets us have greater mastery of our sixth sense. At some times, we can even call upon mental representations of our body in movement. When you learn difficult movements in acrobatics, it's important to represent them a lot for greater efficiency, in fact, in learning them. But like high-level sports people, in fact, going over the motions in slow motion. Let's go, loop. The pilots of France's Alpha Jet Patrol are experts at this mental projection of action. Before each flight, they go through this visualization exercise. In their jargon, it's called the music. Like musicians in front of a conductor, they synchronize with the rhythm of the team leader. When I close my eyes, I project myself directly in my cockpit. That is, I'm on my seat, I see my hand on the joystick, and I can see all the visual references that I've worked on in photos and which I will use, which are reference points for my demonstration. I can see my motor gauges, the key points when I do a loop, I have to check my key points at the top of the loop, and I can see myself looking at them. All that mental planning, which I use in the aircraft, I do on the ground with my eyes closed. It's on the ground that the pilots have to put themselves through the mental and physical conditions of flight. They create in this way the automatic responses which are indispensable once in the plane. When everything happens too fast, so as to have the time to think. So, proprioception for me is like doping. It's doping for the mechanical action which I'll take in the minutes to come. 
dans les minutes à venir. Je I mentalize it. I put into active memory all the reflex actions that I'll have in the plane. When I'm in the plane, I don't think about that anymore. This almost daily mental training for pilots is an exciting field of research for scientists. Christoph lets his brain be scanned by MRI for a completely new experiment made by the team of Christine Assayon. OK, Christophe, we're going to record with the MRI to see how your brain networks are modified according to another expertise that you have, your ability to imagine a movement. The goal of the researchers is to identify, with these champions of visualization, the interactions which can take place between proprioception and mental projection. What's important as well is to say that these internal representations of action or of the body in action are normally not conscious. However, there is a way to be conscious of them, which is to ask the subject to make an action and then to ask them to imagine the action they have just made. And astonishingly, we see that if this is timed, then both are exactly isochronous. Which means that the duration of the imagined movement and the duration of the actual movement are the same. So we can say that the subject can consciously access their representations of action. This capacity to imagine actions that have really been made gives us, in the end, a real training exercise. By associating our body plan, our capacity to concentrate and our proprioception, we have become specialists of mobility. This sixth sense is shared with the majority of animal species. It's indispensable for moving, climbing, or to anticipate the movements of prey. What's less expected is that the plant world may also have it. Research director at the INRA, Bruno Mulia, is exploring this probability. It's a real question nowadays to know to what point proprioception is inherent to the whole of the living world, or if it's limited to certain living creatures. The question is open, and in my opinion we don't know. We can easily conceive that it's a necessity for a living creature to be able to perceive its form a little, so there are people working on that. On the other hand, it does seem all the same that there is a particularly pointed question which has led to the selection of proprioception. I think for land creatures, those which emerge from the water and again for those which try to be erect, to stand straight because postural control is more complicated. Standing up, that's the case, for example, if we humans, we stay standing. It's also the case of most plants which are erect. We can be compared. And so we can say that this is more refined proprioception. The propensity of plants to rise up straight has been an observed phenomenon for over a century. The botanist William Pfeffer was one of the first to make animated images of this phenomenon in the 1900s. But if a plant raises up in such a rectilinear fashion, it is perhaps because it is using proprioception. This idea has been thought about only recently because of a sizable obstacle. The proprioceptive sense is difficult to dissociate from the other senses developed by plants. For Bruno Mulia, this sense really exists in plants, but it has yet to be proved scientifically. 
So we'll bend this plant and what will happen is it will straighten and regain verticality upwards and the question is, where does it get that information? How does it orient itself? Well, we thought obviously that it was light because it grows towards the light and that's generally what was thought. So here we're testing whether it uses other information from light and for that we created a special apparatus, a sphere where light comes from all around. It's as if there was sunlight but coming from everywhere at once and so there's no up or down according to the light and we'll see what happens. Surrounded by uniform light, these anemones will straighten in a single day to become vertical again. So it isn't the light which pulls them upwards in a rectilinear way, but some other information. For the INRA team, other parameters need to be introduced, starting with gravity. How can plants feel this force of attraction and counter it? To reply, we must plunge into their cells and observe their reaction when they are affected by a change of direction. So, here we see what happens at a cellular level when the plant is turned through the microscope. And so we see that there are these special cells which are here and are full of little grains. These are grains of starch, and these grains of starch, they'll descend, so there's a kind of avalanche. The asymmetry of this heap here tells the plant the degree to which it is bent. The lower the pile, the lower it is. This also allows us to see how we can manage to make the plant no longer able to feel gravity so as to completely reveal its proprioception. To cancel out the effects of gravity, it's enough to rotate the plant. By turning, the grains of starch, represented here by plastic beads, are mixed no longer touch the cell walls, and the plant loses its sense of direction, which is dictated by gravity. This loss of reference can be observed thanks to this curious machine, the Gravitron. Young plants, placed in constant rotation, are photographed over several days. Bruno Mulia can then compare the growth of a plant affected by the Gravitron to a control plant which hasn't been rotated. Here, first on the left, we have our control, an indicator which we've just bent and which always perceives gravity. It straightens, you can see it makes a few pushes and it ends up oriented in the direction of gravity and aligns itself with gravity by concentrating its curve at the base. So here we can see what happens after an experiment with the Gravitron. We gave it alternating periods, where as before it perceives gravity and periods where it no longer had that sensation. And so, it's only sensitive to proprioception, to its own shape, and it tends to straighten to make itself straight, and that's what we can see here. There is a phase where it can perceive gravity, and it rises in the same way as before, and then suddenly, it can only perceive its own shape, and it aligns itself in a completely rectilinear shape, which shows its proprioception. It was thought that, so as to grow in a rectilinear way, Plants depended on external factors such as light and gravity. They have, in fact, a proprioceptive sense which maintains their straightness, despite the wind or other external factors. The objective of a growing plant, which is going towards the light, is to get there without having an accident, and that means mobilizing a lot of perception, especially proprioception. Where is it in its own shape? Is it risking taking a shape which will make it fall, 
So it's that objective finally, which we can quite easily understand, which is not to fall. Even a plant which is fixed in the ground can fall if it goes too far. So that's what it's using proprioception for. It's a little different for us, where it's also very useful for the ability to jump on prey or to run away, which obviously isn't an issue for plants. Proprioception is far more than just a sense which allows us to stand up. It is a constituent element of our existence, of our interaction with the world. I'm simply making an analogy between the act of trying to situate yourself physically in space and our desperate attempts to give meaning to our actions. I have the impression that meaning is born from the interaction between our body and that which surrounds us. Proprioception is the sense of action. It is with us in each of our gestures, whether they be conscious or unconscious. When you think about it, it is almost incredible that we know so little about our sixth sense even though we never stop using it. In a time when our bodies are less and less called upon, often made passive by sedentary occupations, benefiting from our proprioception, knowing how to listen to it could bring us much in consciousness of not only ourselves, but also our way of interacting with others, and beyond that, the world.